So I'm going to introduce Corin Hall. Corin has spent 17 years in the broadcast industry before moving into the real estate and mortgages. She took her 20 plus year of mortgage and real estate experience to launch UDirect IRA services, of which I am a client, and that's in 2009. She serves in various leadership roles in organizations like Retirement Industry Association and the Council on Aging in Southern California. She also provides a space for real estate investors to meet and network monthly at OC RIA, the real estate club that she owns. One of the most impressive thing about Karen is one time I saw a presentation where her presentation didn't work and she didn't skip a beat and it was perfect. So that's when you know somebody knows their stuff. <laughs> Karen. Thank you, thank you. It's always a tough act to follow, following Bruce Norris, right? <laughs> Joey wanted me to remind you, by the way, everyone's going to get a copy of the slides. So if, yeah, I know a lot of people are taking pictures, and you can do that too if you want to, but we'll also give you a picture of the slide, or a copy of the slide decks after, okay? Oh man, you know, it's been a, a long number of, I think this is our 12th annual brunch uh, that we've been together, so we've done this a number of times, and in, in the times, I've been in the self-directed IRA industry 15 years, and in that time, it's barely changed at all. It's real, and you know, it almost did though. How many people remember last year, the Build Back Better Act, we were all thinking, what's gonna happen to private equity? And, and it was no joke. And fortunately, through efforts of self-directed IRA people, through uh, private equity people, you know, we got uh, Congress uh, to revisit that. And fortunately for Manchin, it got voted down, yay. I just got back from uh, Washington DC like, nine hours ago, <laughs> and, uh, and we talked about, you know, are any of these provisions on deck right now, and they're not, so this is great. The only thing that's really on deck right now as far as legislation is concerned is something called Secure Act 2.0, that's kind of the nickname for it, and it's a bipartisan thing, which means both parties really like it. Um, our industry, uh, the Retirement Industry Trust Association, we really like it, because it has a lot of super beneficial uh, provisions for savers. Uh, include, one of the great things is increasing the RMD age to 75 because we live longer. So that's one of the great things that's going to come out of that. It's not a, you know, fireworks kind of a, a proposal, but that's really the, you know, you know, little tiny changes. I'm fine with that. With retirement, we don't need big dramatic changes, don't we? You know, we don't need them. We have enough with the stock market. <laughs> so um, I believe I have a clicker. What do you know? This is uh, Udirect IRA Services. And I formed this company in 2009 in the middle of the best time ever to buy a tape of houses. <laughs> are, we, are we ever going to be, be able to buy a tape of houses again? Is that nuts? You know, you can buy houses on tape. You just call the bank and it's like, hey, we've got this whole, you know, group of, of houses. Why don't you just buy them sight unseen? And you do and you make a fortune. And that was great for self-directed IRAs. It was a great time to open you direct IRA services because people could come in, get houses at a super discount and, and hold them. And just last year, we saw so many people in 2021 at the peak selling these houses that they bought in 2009 for great profits. And those profits were tax-free if they had a Roth or tax-deferred. Um, so so that's, that's one of the great things. That's what self-directed IRAs can give you. That, that's a possibility out of the... Out of, the, out of the mix there. But when you, when you think about self-directed IRAs, it's about retirement, it's about saving for later. And we all have to do that because really very few of us are actually prepared to you know, formally retire. It takes a lot of money. So if you had $100,000, and for some people that's a lot of money, and they think, well, I've got $100,000, I think you know, I'm gonna retire on this. You, know, you just break it down and you realize $100,000 is $400 a month. You know, if you were 59 and a half and you lived till you're 86 and a half and you took an even distribution every year, that's all you'd have. So the information that you receive today, I hope you can use it to build your retirement savings um, so that you can retire more comfortably and be ready for this. There is a lot of money in American retirement even still. I don't think anyone's 401k has turned into a 201k yet. You know, that <laughs> the market went back up last week, didn't it? But, uh, but there's a lot of money in the American savings. And I think it's right now, it's um, IRAs, it says 10.4, but like I said, I did just get back from a meeting, it's like 13.7 uh, trillion dollars just in IRA money. There are also funds there, you know, in 401ks, defined benefit plans, um, annuities and things like that, other kinds of retirement vehicles. Uh, so why am I telling you this? First off, it's a great number, <laughs> and it makes us feel safe. You know, we're Americans are savers. 
But also, is anyone in this room raising capital? Anybody? We got one. <laughs> who, people who admit, a couple of people are raising capital. Well, guess what? Self-directed IRAs also provide a pool to draw from uh, when you're raising capital. And in the best case scenario, it's a win-win for everyone, and it can be, that you know, you're raising capital, uh, and through that capital, you're improving a neighborhood, uh, or, you know, or building our neighborhood, making something better, and then the investor uh, ideally receives a good return. So it can be a win for everybody. Okay. So has anybody not heard of a self-directed IRA? I know we have a pretty sophisticated group, but I think everyone's heard about this, like no hands go up, this is great. This is, you know, 15 years ago wasn't this way for sure, but we were talking about it more and more. Um, so these self-directed IRAs were created at the same time as the ERISA Act was passed in 1975. You could always invest in alternative assets. So a self-directed IRA is like any other IRA. It just, it just, it just, the only difference is the asset that you actually put into the account. There you go. So with a typical IRA, it's market correlated assets. And with the self-directed IRA, it's alternative assets. We're here talking about real estate today. That's what we all know and love. But it's also precious metals. Your IRA can have a debt or equity position in a business um, directly or through private equity. Your IRA can invest in actual physical metal that we store. No such thing as gold at home, by the way. If you want to ask me that question later, I'll explain. <laughs> but you can, uh, act, your IRA can actually hold metals, and that's getting more popular. Um, you can buy, what else? You know, uh, mobile home parks. Uh, you can do ground up construction in Garden Grove, you know what I mean? You can do all different kinds of things using self-directed IRA money. Okay, so if anybody doesn't know about it, it's tried and true, like 47 years, older than some of, this, of the people in this room, right? There we go. So again, the difference, the only difference between a typical IRA and a self-directed IRA is the asset class. And we kind of went through those. So it, it's a lot of different things. Um, and yeah, we see, we, I think we see number one, the number one asset in our industry is private equity. Like the Reg A, B, C, D offerings, some where you need to be accredited, some where you're a sophisticated investor. That's the number one asset class, followed by, I think number two would be notes, uh, where people are lending their money uh, to, other, to other projects, secured or unsecured. Okay, so when you talk about investing, I, I, I again, when I was in DC this, this week, I, I headed a fraud panel. And we talked with, uh, on that panel was uh, the CEO of another large self-directed IRA company, um, a couple of them. And also I, I met someone who was actually uh, incarcerated for eight years for stealing money as an SEC, as a broker's a commodities exchange guy. And he turned himself in, and now he's James the fraud guy. <laughs> and, that's his, and he goes around helping people not to be stolen from. And it's, it's a tough thing, it's, it's an emotional thing, and how do, you, how do you keep from being stolen from? How do you prevent fraud? It's so hard because a lot of times when people do um, have a loss in their IRA or somebody commits a Ponzi scheme, they didn't wake up and think, oh, I'm gonna steal a bunch of money. They got into a situation and they robbed Peter to pay Paul, and the next thing you know, they got in over their heads, and that's what happened with our friend James. He uh, was trading money for a lot of, a lot of people, and he had some losses, and for eight years he covered those losses. And he had the kind of education where for eight years he could really, you know, actually make that a, a you know, a, a believable thing. People were even auditing him, and he just, you know, took the logo and put it on his, on his financials, and no one, no one was the wiser. He just couldn't stand the guilt anymore, and he turned himself in and served, it was like eight, nine years in Joliet. It's like, where is he from? It says Chicago, Joliet, <laughs> his places of residence. Um, so... And anyway, so now he's making it his, his life effort. But when, when you do invest, it's not just enough to do your due diligence on day one. Uh, it just really isn't. You have to do your due diligence. I mean, we had an account holder who was just about to invest half a million dollars. Now, that okay, that's great. But think about it. half a million dollars in a retirement account when at that time the most you could contribute was $2,000 a year. That's a lot of money. And how did this woman get this money? And she had been in the military. So she just, I don't know how she did it, but she really saved in her TSP and, and her uh, 457 and, and really, and, and just had half a million. So, so great. So she invested in note. Tell me if you would do this. This note was a $500,000 note on real estate, unsecured. Like what? Like she obviously wasn't sophisticated. 
She certainly wasn't accredited. A note is a security, so if somebody is going to let, um, be taking on, you know, having you lend them a lot of money, they're going to, you know, be that kind of a of an asset uh, sponsor. There, uh, you know, there's a lot of responsibility. They have to be have to have that in, uh, investment uh, approved by the SEC, and they have to be approved by the SEC. So we took a look at this deal, and because it was just so blatantly fraudulent. And we did, we did a little homework, like, well, where does this woman live? She lived in a, like a $50,000 house in the Southeast. So she wasn't a wealthy woman, right? And her, she was in her mid-50s. There was no way she could make this money back over time. And we were able to actually, um, long story, very long story short, have these people put away, incarcerated. So that's great. Yeah, and, and, that, and working with regulators and so forth. And uh, th just recently, there was somebody uh, who... An asset sponsor who had a note, one of our account holders invested in, with them using a note, and they wanted to modify that note. And so what they did is they, they sent to us the note, <laughs> and they just wrote on the front, modify. You know, that's, that's not how you do it, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so that, that just raised some serious red flags. So that's, I mean, if, when we see this, this sort of stuff, we want to look for it. So it's, who is this person? Who's doing this? So there are a lot of resources, um, for, especially for SEC-based assets like FINRA and NASA with an extra A and the SEC and so many different um, places you can go to do due diligence uh, on these kinds of assets. And I, I looked up this guy in the FINRA website and sure enough, he was, he was like uh, suspended from activity several years ago by FINRA. So he wasn't supposed to be doing this at all. And fortunately, in... The FINRA website, where I found this letter that's probably seven years old, his suspension, was the, was the email address of the FINRA officer. And so I emailed her, I said, hey, is this still, is he still, you know, uh, suspended? And she said, yeah, well, by the time we were done, he was barred, now it says barred, and also incarcerated, so he's in jail. And we were able to catch it mid-Ponzi just because of a stupid mistake that we happened to catch. But most of the time, we can't catch fraud. It's, it's so undetectable. I mean, you're the investor and it's your money and, and you're doing your best job, you know, trying to look for fraud. And if we see it, we, we'll do something, but, uh, but we can't always do it. We don't always know when it's gonna happen. So when your IRA does lose money, you don't get to write it off and it's a real loss. Um, if you lost money in the stock market or have ever had this experience, so you really wanna do your homework up front, but then be diligent during the investment to make sure, check up on them. You know, and if it's a private placement, look in the PPM and the subscription agreement and, and see if they are going to provide audited financials, because a lot of times they don't. And if they're not going to provide audited financials, how do you check up on them? So you want to you you know, put their feet to the fire when you're investing in these things. It's just a straight up loss, it's not the kind that Matt and Amanda will tell you you could write off, so you can't write off this kind of loss. And it's hard to replace because you've got contribution limits, don't you? So just know that. I mean, we want to help you invest safely, but there's also the unsafe side. Because, you know, with investing, there's risk. What, was it George? Where's George? We, we were just discussing that this morning. Yeah, that if, with investment, there's risk. He goes, really? <laughs> okay. Um, so what are the limits? <clears throat> Self-directing, you can invest in anything except life insurance and collectibles. Okay, pretty great. That's a real short list. So there are a lot of different asset classes you can put in a self-directed IRA. Um, and there are rules, and the rules are written mostly by the IRS and the Department of Treasury. And the rules are pretty simple, uh, so we'll cover them. So you don't have any personal benefit today from an IRA. No, you don't borrow money from it for yourself. You don't lend money to uh, a disallowed person. We'll talk about that. You don't buy property like houses for your own personal use, present or future. And these kind of rules are written. One of the rule books is irs.gov publication 590, so you can jot that down. Pub 590 has been broken down um, since I started in the IRA field uh, into A and B. A, how the money comes in, and then B, how the money goes out. Okay, so it's, it's, it's an easy read too, and it's very informative. So some people are disallowed to your IRA. What does that mean? It means that your IRA can't do business with them, and I'll, I'll go deeper on that, but it's your lineal ascendants and descendants. Like if you passed away, who would inherit your estate? Think of it like that. You know, you know, your parents, grandparents, you and your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, plus any fiduciary or a 50-50 business partner is a disallowed party. But the people who are allowed are the people out to the sides on your family tree, like your cousins, um, your brothers and sisters, your nieces and nephews, they're allowed, okay? 
Self-directed IRAs, it's not just, I, I need to change the slide because it's not just a game of keep away from fraud, and, we're, and I'm going to be delving more deeply into that in the future, but it's a game of keep away from prohibited transactions because that is also an enemy of your IRA. So when you want to open an IRA, you're going to call us, have a consultation, with, we're going to talk to you, we're going to say, hey, tell us about your investment, who are you investing with, you know, what does it look like, and we're going to be listening to hear if it seems like a prohibited transaction to us. What that means is that neither you nor any of those disqualified people can benefit today, not personal benefit, present benefit, indirect benefit. Like, you can't have your IRA invest in an LLC that then lends the money to your spouse. You know what I mean? That's indirect benefit. I know we're all clever investors and we always want to think of a way, right? <laughs> but you can't do that. Um, you don't buy, sell, or exchange assets between your, your IRA and any of these people. And these disallowed people, including you, they can't provide services to the plan. One of those services is if it's a house, like you can't go, you know, no contribution of sweat equity, you can't swing the hammer or do any of the work on it. You have to hire third party vendors. And also we had uh, one young man, he was buying a house and his father was gonna be the listing agent. So not only would he be breaking the prohibited transaction rule of providing services to the plan, he wanted a commission too. So that would be the top one as well. So that would, be, that would have been two prohibited transactions right there. So we want to help you keep away from prohibited transactions. I don't have a lot of time, but I'll explain that a self-directed IRA has a lot of players in the game. You are the driving force. There's your IRA, um, which is your tool in your tool belt. There's you direct IRA services, the best company in the world. Okay. <laughs> Light rock. Let's talk. All right. And, uh, and then there's our custodian that, that does the cash management in the back. See, I was a radio announcer. That's why I could do that. All right. I'm a professional, don't try that at home. All right, so buying real estate with an IRA with five minutes, we don't have a lot of time to get into it, but with any asset, what you do is you open an account, you get it funded, and then you invest. When it's any kind of asset, you give us the supporting documentation, which would be the, the private placement sub docs. It would be the, um, you know, the agreement to buy a house, the, uh, or it would be a note. Or if you're buying precious metals, maybe like an invoice from the precious metals dealer, okay? And you can actually, your IRA can borrow uh, money through non-recourse lending. When your IRA borrows money, there can be uh, tax. And when there is tax, it can be UDFI, Unrelated Debt Financed Income Tax. It's not an, it's not an income tax like we pay in our 1040. You file a 990T for this. But say you invested in a private placement and that asset sponsor is taking on debt. You, you really want to ask that question going in, hey, are you taking on debt? Because if they say yes, that's going to throw off this tax onto your, um, to your IRA, and your IRA will need to file the 990T and pay the tax that way. Okay? It has a twin tax called UBIT, Unrelated Business Income Tax, and that's when an IRA invests in an active business. Another tax is also due. So we don't have a lot of time, and I can answer questions later, but if you want to know more about these taxes, you can write this down. It's irs.gov publication 598 irs.gov publication 598. There's a checkbook IRA. These are still allowed. Um, I, we actually talked to the IRS this week. <laughs> we were asking them about audits. And they said, oh, no, we're going to use all this money just to, you know, to put more friendly people on the, on the phones. It's like, okay. But if they audit you, <laughs> you know, that's what they said. Um, they're going to come after uh, the IRA-owned LLC. So if you have one, make sure that your bookkeeping is neat as a pin, that you're only using that money for investing, or to pay the expenses of an asset owned by the LLC. That's all you can use that money for. Okay. When we talk about self-directed IRAs, it's, it's sort of an umbrella term. I want you to know that. It's a lot of things. It's the traditional, which is the number one, you know, we have the most traditional IRAs of any type. Traditional, Roth, SEP, simple, spousal, inherited IRAs, and also the solo 401k. All of these things can be self-directed. And the HSA too, which is pretty cool. All right. So how do you do it? Again, three things. Open an account. Doesn't take very long. We have a new uh, cool platform. It's been around about a year or so. So you open an account, and once the account's there, you fund it either by making a contribution, by doing an IRA to IRA transfer, or you talk to your previous employer's plan administrator and do a rollover. If you used to work there, they'll release the money into a new IRA. It's called a rollover. So you get it funded, and now you can invest. So that's where the you direct part comes in. You direct, you tell us, hey, this is what I want my IRA to invest in. Here's the documentation. You fill out a direction of investment form, kind of like a check, like, hey, this is me, this is how much, this is where it goes, check or wire, 
and we disperse the funds. And then you've self-directed. Um, I'll mention too that all proceeds of a self-directed IRA must go in the IRA that owns the asset. And if there are any expenses of the IRA, like filing a 990T, or uh, maybe if you, if you have a note and you have to do some foreclosure or something like that, uh, any kind of expense of the IRA is paid for by the IRA. And in this, at, right now I have zero minutes, so there you go. So I just wanted to show you what I look like after two hours of hair and makeup. <laughs> there you go. And, uh, and we'd love to help you, and we'll have the panel up here answering all your questions in just a little bit. Thanks so much.